Thank you for tuning into this message online or on podcast format. We're so glad that you're able to hear the Word of God. Uh, we'd encourage you to also uh, get into the Word of God on a regular basis on your own. There's no substitute for reading the Word of God yourself. And so we'd encourage you to download a Bible app. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if you're not part of a local church body, we'd love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. Or if you're not in our area, finding a gospel-centered, uh, Bible-based church in your home area to be a part of. There's no substitute for real fellowship with the body of Christ. So we hope that you enjoy this message. We hope that it really blesses your life. And if you would like to support us financially, you can go to our website and do that as well so we can continue to spread, spread the gospel to those in the world around us. Have a great day. God bless you. Good morning. How is everybody? Did you guys see uh, Garrett out here plugging up my laptop because I forgot to charge it? Let's give it up for Garrett. He never gets any glory. He's always up there doing tech stuff, making sure the live stream works, which by the way, what's up online campus, North Campus, how is everybody? But Garrett's a, a great dude and I'm thankful that he's with us here on staff. If you don't know me, my name's Bailey. I'm the worship pastor here at Christ Community Church. I'm pumped up to be here this weekend. We're going to be taking a look uh, in John chapter 13. So if you've got your Bible and you want to turn there, you can go ahead and be turning to John chapter 13. If you don't own a Bible, uh, if you look in one of the trays under the chair near you, uh, you'll probably find one there, and that's for you. It's a gift from us to you. Um, while you're turning there, I want to ask us a question, and it's kind of a heavy question, and I don't want to start a message off all like heavy and serious and stuff like that, but... It's a question that's worth asking, and the question is this, if you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, what would you do today? If you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, what would you do today? I'm not going to ask anybody to answer that question out loud, but let's just take a second and think about it, and I'm sure that our thoughts are going uh, in many different places in response to that question. When I think about that question, my first thoughts instantly go to taking care of my family. You know, I feel like I'd need to double check to make sure my life insurance policy is current, maybe up the payout a little bit. I'd need to talk to Pastor Matt and the elders and maybe work something out to where Tracy could still uh, get my paycheck for a few months after I'm gone or maybe she could get my unused vacation or we could come to some form of agreement where she could get a little bit of money coming in so she could keep paying the mortgage since my salary is the bulk of our income. I'd want to gather all my closest friends and family in my home for a meal and to say my goodbyes. I'd want each of them to know how much they've impacted my life I'd want to gather the worship teams at my house and just thank them for letting me lead them all of these years and just let them know how much they've meant to me. I'd want to talk to my brothers in Christ, like Conrad, make sure that my son continues to learn how to be a man when I'm gone. I'd want to make sure that they were there to help my daughter when her car breaks down or she needs to help fix a light fixture or whatever. I'd want to talk to my parents. I'd want to talk to my sister and my brother-in-law. I'd want to spend as much time with my wife and my kids just likely apologizing for all the wrong that I've done in my life and letting them know that I love them more than I can say with words. And I'm sure that many of you are having similar thoughts and lots of other thoughts when we think about that question. But the reason that I ask that question uh, this morning is because when we answer that question honestly, it reveals to us the things in our lives that we value. For good or for bad, 
When we begin to think of all the things that we would want to do the day before we die, it reveals what our hearts treasure. It reveals what we value. And today we're going to look at a day where Jesus was faced with this decision. See, there was a day that Jesus knew was going to be his final day alive on the earth, right? And there were so many things that he could have done. He's God, right? He could have done anything that he wanted to on his final day on the earth before he died. But instead of spending the evening with his mother or his brothers, his sisters, maybe there was a neighbor that he built tables for or something that he just wanted to thank for being in his life. I don't know. But instead of doing any of that, what did Jesus choose to do? He chose to serve people. He chose to wash people's feet. And I'm telling us that not so that we can come up with some kind of weird hypothetical scenarios and determine that we ever get put into some kind of like squid games or final destination situation where we know that we're going to die the next day, that we can spend it washing people's feet. No, that's not, not what I'm saying. I'm telling us that because in our passage today, we see a glimpse into what Jesus' heart treasured, something that he valued. Serving other people was something that Jesus greatly valued. He told us so. If you remember Mark chapter 10, verse 45, when he said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. It was part of his mission, right? He valued serving so highly that he spent some of his final hours before his arrest doing just that. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. So if you're able, can you guys stand with me uh, just as a sign of respect and honor for the reading of the word? And we're going to be in John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. You can read it out loud with me if you want. Uh, but here we go. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, that was why he said, not all of you are clean. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are, Lord. We're asking for you to just speak to our hearts today as we kind of look uh, at your template uh, for serving others, Lord Jesus. So I pray that you would soften our hearts, that you would open our spiritual eyes, our spiritual ears to hear everything that you have for us, Lord. We love you, and we invite your Holy Spirit into this place with us, Lord. We know that you're here. Uh, make us more and more aware 
of your presence today, Lord Jesus. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys go ahead and be seated. So before we get too deep in the message today, there's something that I'd like us to all do as we think about and as we kind of discuss what we just read. I'd like all of us to try to put ourselves in the room with Jesus that night. And the reason I want you to do this is because I want us to really try and feel what was happening in the room. I want, and and the, the reason I think that we should find ourselves in that room with Jesus is because although we weren't physically in the room when Jesus washed feet, what Jesus did that night was for us. Look with me, verse 1 of our passage. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. You see that, guys? Having loved his own in the world. See, that's you, and that's me. We are his own who are in the world. And, and yes, Jesus loves the world in the John 3.16 sense of the word world, but our passage today specifically talks about his love for his followers, for those who have chosen to follow him while being in the world. So knowing that, we can easily find ourselves here in the story as if we were in the room with Jesus when this happened. Because as I said a minute ago, what Jesus did that night was just as much for us as it was for those who were physically present. And what Jesus was doing that night is he was providing a service template to his followers, to those who were in the world, as to how he would have us to engage with each other and with the world as we are kind of living and navigating and walking through our lives being empowered by his Holy Spirit. And what we need to understand, though, is this isn't just like a, a one-off example of how to do nice things. For it's real easy for us to come to passages like this and think, man, you know what? That was a nice thing that Jesus did for his disciples. And so I'm going to be like Jesus, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to do the occasional nice thing for other people. But that's, not, that's really not the point. What we see here is a picture being painted for us that is a culmination of Jesus' entire life. We see Jesus as the suffering servant in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, and that's because Jesus' entire life was lived as a life of service to other people. I can't find a single place in Scripture where Jesus did miracles or taught or acted or interacted with others to advance his own name or his own agenda. So don't get me wrong, Jesus had an agenda, all right, he did, but even that was in service and obedience to his Father. His entire life was lived as a life of service, and as his followers, those of us who bear his name, Christian, our entire lives should be too. So last week, uh, Pastor Conrad's takeaway was, if I, savor Jesus as, if I savor Jesus as Savior, I'll want to serve him as Lord. And over the next four weeks, uh, Pastor Conrad and myself are going to kind of be building off of that thought. And so our takeaway today, it does just that. It builds off of last week's takeaway. And our takeaway today is, if I savor Jesus as Savior, I want to serve him as Lord by serving others. It's a bit wordy. Sorry. If I savor Jesus as Savior, I want to serve him as Lord by serving others. You see... Part of serving Jesus as Lord involves us serving others. Why? Because when Christ has transformed our lives and set us free from the bondage of our own sin and our own will, we now live a life that is daily being shaped to look more and more like him by the power of his Holy Spirit. You see, I've died 
to myself. I no longer live for myself, but rather I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's Galatians 2.20. And so now my values have changed. Now I value what Christ values. And in our passage today, Jesus gives us a template for what this looks like in our lives. And and I'm calling it a serving template, uh, and I'm calling it a template rather than an example because examples can be messed up a little bit easier than templates. So let me, let me, let me tr- try to explain what I mean. Templates provide more of an accurate result. And, and, and like I said, I'll try to explain this. So recently, I've started building and restoring and, and remodeling guitars. And it started out because there was this one guitar from Fender. We've got a picture of it. That's it. And I thought that thing was sick. And I was like, I want that guitar. But it was on back order for like eight months. And so I thought to myself, you know what? I can build one faster than that. And it's turned out to be something that I really, really enjoy and I'm actually pretty good at. So if anybody wants a quality guitar for less than you can get a Guitar Center, hit me up. Um, But anyway, I had an idea in mind of what I wanted the guitar to look like when I was finished. That's kind of what I wanted wanted it to look like when I was finished. That was an example of what I wanted to look at. I wanted it to look like. And part of building a guitar uh, is routing out where the pickups go. So those, those white and black rectangle things there, those are the pickups. And it's just basically a magnet wrapped around where the strings go over. Then when you plug it in, it makes sound. So <clears throat> those don't just rest on the body of the guitar. The wood's actually routed out, and they sit down uh, in the cavity that's been routed out in the body. So yes, I could have... Uh, just taken a router and went, looked at the example and went and started trying to route out cavities for the pickups. But if I would have done that freehand, there's a very, very high possibility that I was going to screw that up, right? Or, but if I've got uh, a template that's made out of plexiglass or wood or, or plastic, now I just got to stick it to the body of the guitar with some double-sided tape, and then I'll just trace it with the router, and it comes out exactly the way that it was intended. A perfect reproduction, so to speak. Or another, another example maybe let's say you wanted to draw a picture of a bird, like a toucan, and, and somebody can show you a drawing of a toucan that they did as an example But when most of us look at their example drawing of a toucan and we try to draw a toucan on our own freehand, it turns out looking more like a chupacabra than a toucan. Am I right? How many artists we got in the room? (laughs) But if we trace the drawing of the toucan, then we all become a little bit better artists, don't we? So basically what I'm saying is I can look at an example, an example of a guitar and know what I want it to look like when I'm done building it, or I can look at an example of a drawing of a toucan and know what I want it to look like when I'm done drawing it, but if I don't have a template to trace, I'm going to mess it up because of my own human error and because of my own sinfulness, I'm going to make a giant mess out of it, right? And Jesus is giving us a template to follow. He's he's coming alongside us and helping us, saying, guys, I'm showing you how to do this where you won't screw it up. He's not just giving us an example. He's providing for us a template to follow. In our passage today, the example of serving is washing feet. That is a way to serve, but the template for serving comes in at least, at least three parts. I don't know what that was, but it comes in at least three parts, probably more. But for the sake of time, we're going to look at just three tools that provide our service template today. First thing I want us to see is that service requires humility. Serving requires humility. Look at me. Uh, Verse 2 of our passage, during supper... 
When the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, and just a side note, yes, Jesus did wash Judas' feet too, not just Peter, James, and John, who were his closest boys, but even the one that he knew was going to do him wrong. That's a side note. It probably actually takes a little bit more, or a lot bit more humility to serve the people that just get under our skin. That's another message for another time. Verse 3, oh, dude, I almost went off just now. <laughs> and I was like, the Holy Spirit said, rain it in. Verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist and then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And see, here we see a picture of Jesus humbling himself probably in the most extreme way he possibly could at the time. You see, not only did he strip his outer garments off and tie a towel around his waist, which is a picture of him laying aside his heavenly royalty on his own accord and assuming the position of a servant, Philippians 2, 5 through 7, remember, having this in mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So not only did he assume the dress and the position of a servant, but then he washed men's feet, which was the lowest form of service that could possibly be done in that time, in that culture. There's just something about feet in that culture that just shows a great sign of disrespect. And we see it even uh, today a little bit uh, in, the, in the Middle Eastern cultures. Remember, do you guys remember when uh, the United States invaded Iraq and they tore down the, uh, the, the statue of Saddam Hussein. And what do we see on the news? We saw kids with their shoes in their hands hitting the statue. You guys remember that? Or what about the time in like 02 when President Bush was up there giving that speech and the dude just threw the shoe at him and he's like, Sigh! you know, like, like boom, like right there. It still shows a sign of disrespect even in today's culture. But in those days, washing feet was reserved for the lowest of the low. It showed the utmost contempt to require someone to wash your feet. It was such a degrading task that it was reserved for slaves, but not just any slaves, only Gentile slaves, the dogs that they referred them to. You see, Jewish rulers wouldn't even require other Jews to wash their feet. This is how low of a task this was. So think about Think about the most humiliating thing that our culture could require of someone in public, and this is what Jesus was doing, whatever that is. And I love how Jesus, at that point, just turns everything that we think that we know and we think that we understand upside down on its head. Like I said, the humiliating act of washing feet is something only Gentile slaves would do, not Jewish rabbis. And that culture at the time was very similar to ours in the sense that the more power and the more money and the more prestige and the more platform you have, the less you are expected to do acts of service and the more you are expected to be served. Am I right? It's just our culture. It's almost like a cultural goal has been set and people are just striving to reach it. You know? Oh, I make X amount of dollars, so I don't have to do that. I have somebody do it for me. Oh, I have X amount of followers on social media, so now I'm an influencer and people do what I say. I do this for a living or I do that for a living. And it's, it's an important role. I'm somebody, so serving others is beneath me. And honestly, I saw it just last week. 
And, th- and this is a lean-in moment, guys. I mean, it really is. I'm not uh, mad. I'm not upset. I'm not calling anyone out. I'm just stating an observation, and it goes good with the message, and so I'm going to use it. This is a lean-in moment for us. I saw it just last week. I saw this very thing last week in this very church. See, we had a coffee spill out in the lobby between the 9 and 11 o'clock service, and the person who did it was down on their hands and knees trying to clean up coffee with those non-absorbent paper towels that we have in the bathroom. You know, you know the ones that just kind of smear the water around on your hands, and then as soon as you come out of the bathroom, somebody sees you, and they're like, hey, how's it going? And then you have to shake their hand with the wet, you know? And then it's awkward, and everybody always makes the joke, oh, I promise it's water. <laughs> you know, like, we all do it. Do we not do it? We do it. Anyway, so the person who spilled the coffee is down on the floor trying to, t- trying to clean it up with the non-absorbent paper towels, and I come out of the back of the sanctuary, I see it happening, and I notice that nobody's really helping out. And so I walk down to the janitor's closet in the children's lobby, I open the janitor's closet, there was already some water in the mop bucket, so I put the mop in, I wring it out, come back up here, I grab a wet floor sign, I mop up the spill. And listen, I'm not telling you guys that so I can be like, hey guys, everybody look what I did. I mopped up some coffee. I'm telling you that because honestly, I'm a little bit sad by the fact that nobody got there to help before I did. I just remember thinking, man, we're better than this. This church is better than that. Good? Not today, Satan. But I remember thinking, I remember being a little bit sad by the fact that no one was there to help out before I got there. Not so it would be somebody else's problem, but because it's an honor and a commandment for us to serve others. And it just bummed me out a little bit. And I can admit that maybe Someone had gone to find someone with a key to the janitor's closet or to grab something more absorbent than bathroom paper towels to help out, but I didn't see it. Not in the the time that it took me to go down there, grab the mop, mop it up, put up the sign. But my point is that's just the culture that we, we live in. We're conditioned to believe that serving in a humiliating way is beneath us. And here Jesus is throwing power and position and money and status and reputation out the window, and he's showing us that his heart is to serve. He's showing us and instructing us to empty ourselves of entitlement and pride for the good of other people. You see, Jesus rules everything, right? He could have required that he be served, yet he lived in such a way as to show us that he's not above anything, but lowers himself in service to others. The template for service first requires humility, and we see it it validated uh, in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28, don't we? If you want to read that later, go back and read it, but I'm just going to paraphrase. So you remember the time that Jesus and his disciples were just out doing whatever it is that they did that day, and then like James and John's mom came up to Jesus, and she's like, Lord, please let my son sit at your right and left hand in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is like, hold on, first of all, That's not mine to give, so you need to bring it down about 25%. And then all the other disciples got mad, right? And honestly, I probably would have been upset about it too. Like, first of all, why is your mom here? Second of all, all, how prideful are you to ask our Lord to sit at his right and left hand? And then I would have gotten prideful by judging them for being prideful, and it would just have been a giant mess. But Jesus says to them, Matthew 20, 25, he says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones 
exercise authority over them shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The template for serving first requires humility. Second thing we see in our template for serving, if we're going to serve like Christ, is that it requires selflessness. Look with me in verse 6 of our passage. He came to Simon Peter who said to them, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered, what I am doing you do not understand, but afterwards you will understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Me. And what we see here is Jesus pointing to the cross. He's pointing to the cross that was coming in just a few hours and the supreme act of cleansing for our sins that was going to be offered there. And what he's saying to Peter is, Peter, if I don't go to the cross, if I don't die and suffer for you, you cannot be washed. And if you don't accept that cleansing, you have no part with me. And we see a beautiful, beautiful picture of Jesus' selflessness right here. Because Jesus isn't doing this for himself. He's doing this for Peter. He's doing it for the other disciples. He was doing it for you. He was doing it for me. You think that Jesus was looking forward to the torture and murder that was coming his way? You think that Jesus was like, you know what? I need some me time. So I think I'm going to go get murdered. No. We know because of his prayer in the garden, when he asked his father, please let this cup pass from me, that this was not for himself. The selfless atoning cleansing act of going to the cross was for everybody but Jesus. It was for his own who are in the world. Because he loved us to the uttermost. And I love that we have the benefit of looking back at the situation and knowing what we know now. Because we can understand what's going on here, but Peter proves Jesus was right when he said that Peter didn't understand what was happening because of his next comment. Verse 9, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. You are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. And that was why he said, not all of you are clean. Look carefully with me at what Jesus is saying here. Because Jesus, as he so often does, he's speaking spiritual language through what's playing out in the physical and here he's painting a picture for us of the ongoing relationship that we have with him when we give our lives to him. What he's saying, he's saying, Peter, you're clean. You are mine. And I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to seal that for you. I'm going to seal that for them. I'm going to seal that for all those in the future who are my own in the world. You are clean, but you're still going to mess up. You're still going to drop the ball. You're still going to trace outside the lines. You're still going to need a daily foot washing for me. And I, lo I really love the fact that feet are used here. I really do. Because as I was preparing for this message and I was praying through it, I heard the voice of Jesus through his Holy Spirit saying so clearly to me. And he's saying it to you as well. He's saying, my son, my daughter, you are clean but you step in it often. <laughs> keep coming to me for cleansing every day. Keep repenting. Keep seeking my face. Keep walking in my ways. Keep pressing into me. My mercies are new every morning and every minute of every day to clean the crap off your feet. You are mine, and I love you to the uttermost. And it's so beautiful that Jesus knows that after our salvation, after we give our lives 
to him, we are going to need constant forgiveness and repentance and confession, and he is willing to give it and to sanctify us into his image more and more. But what does that mean for us? It means that his humility and his selflessness is ongoing. He is always forgiving. He's always cleansing. He's always interceding. He's always advocating. He's always serving us. And if that's true, and if we are following his template for serving, then it means that our humility and our selflessness must be ongoing as well, right? See, we're not going to get off that easy. That's why I titled the message, Live to Serve. Because like I said earlier, Jesus, Jesus isn't just showing us one-off things to do and ways to do kind things for people. He's giving us a template to live a life of service just like he did. And lastly, serving requires sacrifice. It does. It's going to cost you something. We've seen Jesus model humility and selflessness, and it's all pointing toward the ultimate sacrifice that he would take for us on the cross, where he would take all, all of our sin on himself, who knew no sin. He would be tortured. He would be crucified, that he might redeem us and bring us back to God. Serving costs Jesus everything, and he is commanding us to follow his template and do just as he did. Look with me at verse 13 of our passage. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Guys, serving others is going to cost us. Because remember, if I savor Jesus as Savior, I'm going to want to serve him as Lord by serving others. And it's going to cost us. It may cost you your reputation. Because I'm no longer interested in living like the world. Guess what? People are going to talk. They are. I can promise you that. It may cost you your job. Because I'm no longer interested in doing whatever it takes just to earn a dollar. I'm not going to engage in shady business practices anymore, but rather I'm going to humbly serve others in my workplace by treating them fairly. It may cost you your job. It may cost a relationship. It may cost you your time. It may cost you some convenience. There's tons of things that it could cost us, but if we're going to serve the way that Jesus served and we're going to follow his template for service, there's one thing that I can promise it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you your life. And I'm not saying that we're going to lose our life in the physical sense that Jesus lost his but Jesus has called us to model him by serving others in a life of service. He provided the template. And if Jesus' life was lived as a life of service to others, why should we think that we would be any different? We have been called to carry and to take up our cross and follow him. And guess what? We don't carry our crosses for funsies. We carry our crosses to die on. A servant's not greater than his master or a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So as a follower of Christ, I now take up the responsibility to die to my pride, to die to myself, and to live a life of sacrifice to others by bearing his image. And I now live to reflect him to the world for his glory, for his fame, and it's for my joy. If I savor Jesus as Savior, I'll want to serve him as Lord.
by serving others. And that's the challenge today. The challenge today is to commit our lives to serving Christ by serving others. I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm telling you that it's hard. I believe that Charles Spurgeon said it best when he said, my old self has been crucified with Christ, but man, he's slow to die. You guys feel that? This is what Christ has called us to. And if he has called us to it, he will be faithful to get us through it. As Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24, God who called you is faithful. He will surely do it. What would it look like? Guys, just dream with me for a second. What would it look like if every action and decision we made in our lives, we ran it through the template by asking those questions first? Is it humble? Is it sacrificial? Is it selfless? Now, obviously, every single decision that we make can't be all three of those things, but it's a great place to start. What if every dollar we spent, we asked those questions? What if every social media post we made, we asked those questions before we hit post? I think there'd be a lot more delete, huh? What would our world look like if we went into work with humble, selfless, sacrificial attitudes and spirits before we engaged our coworkers just seeking to serve them the best that we can? What if instead of spending our weekends or our days off watching YouTube, guilty, we, we gave sac sacrificially of our time? And this isn't a push for volunteers, guys. I'm not up here preaching, being like, we're going to get some volunteers this weekend. That's not what I'm doing. But this is a great place to start. This is a, a great place to get plugged in and start serving. We've got opportunities available from greeting people at the door to serving with the youth to serving in the children, from worship to tech to helping mow the grass. It's a great place to get plugged in. But what if on our days off or our weekends, we invested our time serving others? Maybe you're married and you're realizing that you haven't been serving your spouse the way that Christ has called you to. What would your marriage look like if you run every interaction through those questions? Are my actions humble? Are my actions selfless? Are my actions sacrificial? How could we serve our kids better by asking these questions? How could we serve the people that are closest to us better with humility and selflessness and sacrifice by just asking these questions. Or I'm gonna make it a little bit easier for us. What if we just have an easier starting point? What if all we simply did for the next month was just ask one question and ask, is this humble? And we just try to show a little bit of humility in everything that we did. What if we follow Paul's instructions in Philippians chapter two and in humility we counted other people as more significant than ourselves? What if we followed Paul's instruction in Romans chapter 12 and we tried to do, outdo one another in showing honor? Man, what a change we would see in the world for the gospel, right? I don't know exactly what it would look like because I don't think that I've ever seen it before. But I know that it's what we're called to do. So what areas in your life need to be submitted to the authority of Jesus today? Are you living humbly? Are you living selflessly? Are you living sacrificially? Do you even know Christ? Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you've been blessed by the service. If you don't have a church home, we would love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. And you can connect with us by going to cccfamily.com. Let us know that you've been uh, joining us for church. You can fill out the online connect card there. Give us your information. We can help you take the next step. If you have a prayer concern that you'd like our prayer teams to pray about, you can do that as well. If you'd like to support the ministry here at Christ Community Church, you can also give online at cccfamily.com and we appreciate all that God is doing in and through each and every one of you. Hey, thanks again for joining us this week. We look forward to seeing you again soon, either online or in person. God bless you.